century, when inventors were creating a steam engine, scientists warned the authorities to try and stop the idea because they believed that if a human being exceeded the incredible speed of 30 miles an hour, they'd suffocate and be crushed by the force of gravity. Sometimes it's only the limitations of the human mind that makes the possible seem impossible. Tonight, we investigate the age-old art of palmistry. Is it simply a fairground attraction? Or is it possible that there's something to be read between the lines? We enter the strange world of the psychomantium, where it's claimed people can meet and talk with their lost loved ones again. It's against the TV regulations to broadcast a seance on television. However, we've been given permission to show you a remarkable piece of film made by some scientists in the 70s. See what you make of this. Although this is not to be encouraged for viewers, people have been trying it for centuries. A group gets together and invites a ghost to join them, and then, to show it's arrived, shake the table for them. After the invention of photography, fraudsters and conmen made fortunes faking stunts like this. Then, every once in a while, something would happen that no one was expecting. This old film was made by an amateur cameraman who claimed that a ghostly force was at work. But was it a trick? Watch carefully. In slow motion, the table rises into the air, bearing the full weight of a woman. Slow the action down again. Is anyone actually applying enough force to make the table move? Can you see wires or rods or magnets? Or anything else that might explain what's happening? There's no doubt that the table's moving, but for skeptics there's not enough evidence in these pictures to convince them that it's a genuine paranormal phenomenon. But 30 years ago in Canada, these people set up an experiment that was to become a classic in paranormal research. Well, why don't we create a completely imaginary character in order to prove the point? No, they created their own ghost, literally from scratch. They invented a fictional character and then tried to make it a reality by willing it to exist. An artist drew a man's portrait. They gave him a name, Philip, a 17th century aristocrat who lived at Diddington Manor near Oxford. Philip subsequently was stricken with remorse. Finally, they decided he died tragically after his wife discovered his illicit love affair with a beautiful young gypsy girl. Finally, one morning his body was found at the bottom of the battlements whence he had cast himself in a fit of agony and remorse. That was the life and the death they created for Philip, their DIY ghost. You really used your imagination on that one. <laughs> Hello, Philip. Are you there? Good morning, Philip. Over many weeks, they met regularly and pleaded with Philip to show himself and become a reality. Speak up. Nothing happened. Let's hear some knocks. Then, one night, they decided they were all getting much too serious about things. So they opened a few bottles and started singing to their imaginary ghost. George knows my father. Suddenly, the incredible occurred. Philip answered a question with a sharp knock on the table. Have you brought Dorothea with you? Then another. Did you like Dorothea? And another. Did you like Margot? Good. And then things really started to happen. These spectacular scenes recurred many times over the next few months. Whenever they met to conjure up Philip, the table danced and tilted in the air as soon as they laid their hands upon it. Skeptical experts came from far and wide to search for trickery and fraud, but they found nothing suspicious. So if it wasn't a trick, what was happening? Had they really created a ghost? Was such a thing possible? They decided it wasn't. They came to the conclusion that when they relaxed and started to have fun, they were ready to believe that anything was possible, just as they used to when they were kids. 
When they really believed that the table could move, suddenly it did. In the world of the paranormal, this is called psychokinesis. It means the ability to harness the power of the human mind to influence solid objects. Some researchers say that children are better at psychokinesis than adults because they haven't been told yet what is supposed to be impossible. Is that what was happening here? Simply because they started behaving like kids? Following our last series, we received tons of letters asking for superhumans who could demonstrate the power of mind over matter. We found an amazing Hungarian who has the most incredible strength in his jaw. With his interpreter, please welcome Arpad Nick. Thank you very much for coming. Could you ask Arpad when he first discovered he had this special strength? He trains a lot, that, that, that is as far as the physical strength is concerned, but he has an inner strength which he can't explain. Uh, we're going to ask him to do a demonstration with these iron bars in just a moment. They really iron, and I'm going to try and bend one over my knee. Uh, I can't, so they're quite strong. Okay. <laughs> now I would like to bend this iron bar with my jaw and teeth. Just before we do that, I'd like to take a look in his mouth and see his teeth. I want to check there's no hidden metal plates in there. Can I see inside? Yeah, there doesn't appear to be anything in there that shouldn't be. Okay. <laughs> He's using what he calls his superhuman inner strength. And he's going to attempt something that would simply destroy the teeth of any ordinary person. Well, I think I will be on safe ground in saying, don't try this at home. <laughs> Thank you. And if you think that was impressive, earlier today, Arpad used the incredible strength of his jaw to do something we couldn't do here in the studio. He pulled three minibuses filled with school children. See what you make of this. Dulwich College in South London, 50 boys from the lower school pack into three minibuses which are then linked together with metal bars. Arpad will attempt to pull the convoy 30 feet using only his teeth. An extraordinary feat of superhuman strength if he can do it.
can a palmist really tell about your past and your future just by looking at the lines on your hand? Find out in just a moment. Bereavement is something that eventually affects everybody and it can be a vulnerable time for many. Some people are turning to what's called a psychomantium. It's claimed that it can put grieving people in touch with their dearly departed. Is that really possible? The psychomantium is a dark room with a small light source. There's a mirror at one end and facing it a comfortable chair. The mirror is at an angle so that the person in the chair cannot see his or her reflection, just a black void. The psychomantium is being used in the United States and Canada by about 20 people for bereavement healing. And by bereavement healing, I mean um, most bereavement counselors at some point hear, if only I had five more minutes, if only I had one more minute. And this is basically what it's used for, for closure. So a person can go in, they can see their deceased loved one, and say that one last thing that they didn't get to say, and have closure with that relationship. How we believe this works is that when the person is looking into the mirror, their optic lens becomes so sensitive. You see, out in the open we're so used to everything around us, our optic lens is not sensitive at all. We have so much dimness. We have colors, we have vibrations, we have lights. But then when we go into this dark room, or what we could even call a deprivation tank, the optic lens becomes so sensitive that we can see things that we can't see what's in our normal environment normally. We can look around and there's entities all around. We asked Jean Bartlett and Hazel Tingley to try the psychomantium. Hazel's husband Hugh died a year ago from a heart attack. On the day my husband died, it was a very ordinary Saturday and uh, we'd been together in the afternoon and he had to pop over the road for a few minutes. I was just thinking I better get something for tea when there was a knock at the door and it was the doctor. He said that my husband had just been taken to hospital so I sort of reached for my coat and he said no. He said I, I've had to certify him dead and I just couldn't really take it in. Hugh's death was brutally sudden. Hazel had thought he was in good health. I feel that any contact I can have with my husband will be a good experience. I certainly haven't come to terms with the fact that he's no longer with me. As I said, I feel him around me. I think that it's too early days yet for me to really let go. Jean Bartlett had the opposite experience. She knew for some time that she'd lose her father as he was suffering from both cancer and Alzheimer's disease. With Dad having Alzheimer's, it, it's, it's very hard with the loss of memory. He lost everything of our childhood, our names, everything. So in the end, you know he's your dad, but he's a stranger. I want to know that he didn't suffer that's, that's the biggest question of all. Um, I want to know that he did pass, pass away nicely and not so tragically as we all, all think he did, um, and that he's at peace. Most of all, I would just like, after all the, the, the two years of him not knowing our names, I would just like Dad to just turn around and say, I love you, Jean. And that, that's, that's what I want more than anything. He'd always looked after me tremendously. He sort of took over from the minute I met him, really. And Before people go into the psychomantium, they're counseled by Diane and made to think carefully about what they'd like to say so that they're ready for any contact that may happen. Some people need a bridge. Like for your dad to suddenly show up, he may think it's going to startle you, or the spirits, whoever, whomever. Not everybody who tries the psychomantium believes that they see a deceased loved one in the mirror. 
but many others claim to experience unusual sensations or see mysterious images in the glass. When a person goes inside the booth, they sit down in a chair, become very relaxed, and simply look into the mirror. Uh, usually they say that it begins to, toward the outside of the mirror, begins to look like a cloud or maybe some colors. And eventually, after usually about 30 minutes, um, someone comes in. It may be a spirit guide, it may be a deceased loved one. I sort of saw things, but they were got, I couldn't quite grasp hold of them. Do you know what I mean when you sort of just see something and you, you just can't grasp and it's gone? I didn't feel afraid. Um, sitting in the room, looking in the mirror was like um, a 3D effect. It was, it was really strange, but looking through it, it was like a stage. I felt like that I was the audience. And there was the stage and the curtain going across. I saw some coloured light. I saw quite a lot of purple. And um, I saw some light at the bottom of the, of the mirror. Oh, at one time, um, the mirror turned into what looked like a door, a, a door to go through. It just sort of suddenly looked like a door, uh, maybe a gateway to something. I felt... Um, like a mist come across my face. Just before I was to come out of the room, there was a real icy cold went right through me and it was strange because I'd been s sitting in the chair quite warm and snuggled up. But this cold was really, really cold. It was something I've never felt. I've just felt this warm blanket of love I was surrounded with. It was a wonderful feeling and I didn't really want to come out from this lovely warm feeling. The feeling I feel at this present time is, is really nice. The, the anxiety that I felt, the upset, for some, somehow, has just, just seemed lifted. It really is, I, ca I can't explain it. It's, it's so strange, I feel as if an awful weight's been lifted off my shoulder. So what exactly is going on here in these lengthy sessions in the Psychomantium? As a clinical hypnotist, one thing that I do know for sure is that if you focus on any object for long enough, the pattern of your brain waves will begin to change until eventually you enter hypnosis. And in that state, it's not unusual for people to find themselves experiencing what they most want to see and hear and feel. In other words, they hallucinate. Nothing wrong with that, but it's got nothing to do with the paranormal as far as I can see. For thousands of years, it's been believed that the patterns in our hands are the blueprint for our physical and psychological selves. These days, many people are turning to the ancient wisdom of palmistry for answers. People who read palms say that everything about us is encoded in those lines and that they can read them like a book. With us tonight is someone who believes that they can do just that. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Robin Lown. Hi, Robin. Thank you for coming. Now, you're not a professional palmist, you do it as a hobby. It's a hobby. And how did you get interested in it? Uh, a long time ago. Um, go back to school days. Uh, history of art I was studying at the time actually showed me that the paintings plus sculptures all showed lines in the hands. And why should that be? So I decided to find out. Now, if you take a look at this palm, for example, what would you say about that? I mean, what kind of person is this? An artistic performer uh, with a bit of a sense of fun, probably some interest in publishing, I should think. Well, it's me, actually. You forgot to say good-looking and uh, handsome and all those sort of things as well. A couple of days ago, we found a volunteer and took her palm print. Then we gave it to Robin. He's never met her, he doesn't even know her name. But if Robin's reading has been successful, he should now know a great deal more about our volunteer, more than may be comfortable. There's only one more thing that Robin has to do to complete his reading, and that's to look at the back of our volunteer's hands. So, may we have a look at those hands, please? Right. Well, I suppose you just want the main points. Yes, just, just kind of make it into five or six bullet points, if okay, that's okay. Right. Main, some main points. Um, this person has uh, a great deal of energy, a real powerhouse of energy, and uh, is a self-developed performer, and uh, some connections with America, well-traveled, about the age of eight or nine, uh, some illness, and again recurring perhaps about 11 to 13, 
uh, most likely to with, with the throat. At age 18, uh, developing her own way of uh, cutting through life, a career, and then again at round about the age of 30, this person realising they need to develop an image and uh, develop their voice and paid a lot of attention to those areas. And then moving on again at 35, I think she felt her career, she had really fallen on her feet, her career had taken off and uh, she was developing into the media, that's radio, chat shows, interviews, that kind of thing. And then coming almost up to date, uh, has been developing a new venture moving away, departing from old works that she's known before, but she's putting a lot of energy and effort into it, and I think at the moment it's taking its toll on her health. She really does need to rest. OK. So let's find out how close to the truth all that was. Let's meet our mystery volunteer, Linda Lusardi. Yeah. Great to see you, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> I have a nurse as well. Uh, oh, yeah, take it <laughs> So, Linda, honestly, how much of that was correct? How much wasn't? Well, I think it was pretty accurate on a lot of the points there. Um, I mean, I don't know about the health. I think that was about the only thing that I could say was incorrect. I, I mean, I didn't have any major illnesses at seven or, or okay. when I was a child. What happened when you were 18? <clears throat> well, when I was 18, I was spotted at a bus stop and my modelling career started. What about 30? 30 was a big change point because um, I went from, from modelling into the acting and TV work, so yeah. that was a big departure. And music as well? Music, well, I mean, I've, you know, I've dabbled in the music, I've sung in pantomimes and, and musicals, <laughs> yes, and I've had to develop the singing voice. I don't think I've developed it very far, but uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's obviously part of my work now, my voice. And what about the health, Linda? Well, I mean, Robin said that I've, I'm suffering with my health at the moment. Well, I'm not really ill, but uh, I'm extremely tired at the moment because I've just had a baby, so I'm, I'm suffering from lack of sleep. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Robin Lown and Linda Lusardi. <laughs> And with that, we come to the end of this series. I hope you found it as fascinating as I have. Until next time, good night. Yeah.